<clears throat> hey, thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is uh, Chris with Salamander. We're going to uh, just wait just a few moments, let everyone uh, have a chance to hop on, um, and we will start the presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Chris Descato, and uh, I, I thank you for joining us on uh, Friday at 12 o'clock. Um, and this will, I guarantee you, be part of your week, not just because it's Friday. Um, Mark, can you forward? So I'm proud to be joined by Mark Miller today, um, who is the Global Collaboration Sales and, and Strategy for Cisco. Uh, my name is Chris Descato. I'm Director of Sales for Salamander. Um, and, and today, uh, if you can advance one more, Mark. So today, what we're what we're, what we're going to be talking about is um, collaborative, flexible workspaces and how we're seeing the the workspaces develop. Um, you know, one thing that we're going to be talking heavily about is is video integration, and we're seeing more companies um, integrate video because going forward, there's almost always going to be a virtual participant, and how these rooms come together um, is very important. And we're going to be talking about how they can come together very flexible um, way, your very easy way, um, using Salamander and Cisco, which we have a great partnership. Um, and, and it's pretty unique. Not only are we partnering on a lot of uh, technology and, and how the rooms come together, uh, but also um, we're a supplier for Cisco as well. Um, so I'll let Mark take it away. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, I appreciate your time today. Um, it, once again, as a quick intro, my name is Mark Miller. I work at Cisco in our collaboration technology group, and I lead a, a, a small team within Cisco focused around the future of work. Um, in that role, I get an opportunity to talk to clients a lot around their future of work um, uh, plans and, and how they're seeing the future of the workplace. I also get an opportunity to work with Cisco's real estate and HR teams and our IT teams as we're thinking about the redesign of our workplace. And, and a lot of the story we're gonna to talk to you about today is our evolution and our evolution around the workplace as it sits at Cisco. We're roughly about 22 million square feet of, of office real estate, most of it carpeted, a great majority of it carpeted, um, spread over 94 countries, uh, 492 buildings or so, um, and an asset that obviously we are constantly looking to do uh, different things with. You know, our evolution of our workplace really started with the, the rollout of, of collaboration technology. Um, although many things have truly impacted the workplace setting, and, and you folks all know this, right? Uh, changing nature to work, the rise of the millennials and their entry into the workplace, the demand for flexibility. I would tell you the technology, I think, has been both a catalyst and a savior around uh, the workplace. Um, and, and what I think is really interesting and the observation that we've made here at Cisco is the more collaboration technology we gave our folks, the more their expectations around the workplace have changed. Um, and in fact, we did a study uh, back uh, about uh, seven years ago, um, in 2013, and we realized that we were sitting on a lot of real estate that was was really being sub-optimized. You know, we were sitting at the time about 27 million square feet of office real estate. And when we looked at how our spaces were being used, using badged in data, our occupancy was sub 50%. And the reality is that we started to look at how people were really using the spaces because people don't badge out when they leave. Our utilization was closer to 26 to 28%. And, and that really started this whole effort we had at Cisco to look to do a lot of consolidation of our real estate, like many of you have done, but also taking a sliver of that savings and redesigning the workplaces we had. 
And, and what I find interesting is, you know, as, as much as we went through this exercise, I'll, I'll show you some pictures of some of the offices we built over the course of the years. This is Sydney, Australia. We're looking at Sydney Harbor, beautiful site. Uh, Toronto, uh, a new office we opened up in Singapore. Um, and, and this is one of my uh, my favorite ones. This is uh, in Barcelona, Spain. This is an abandoned 200-year-old textile mill uh, that we uh, we did a little work on. Uh, actually, the building didn't even have a, a roof, uh, but it's now our innovation center for Central Europe and one of the most spectacular buildings I think we've developed. And, and through this journey, we realized that we needed to keep tight alignment around space design, technology, and, and culture. And, and those three things really always came together as we redesigned our offices. Um, here's the interesting fact. We got through a massive consolidation at Cisco around our, our footprint. Um, and, and last year, pre-pandemic, we started to look at actually how our workplaces were being used again. And as even as much as the, of what we did around consolidation and transformation, and I mean consolidation of almost a third of our portfolio, when we looked at how our people were using our space again, our utilization was back down to about 50%. The reality is technology is making space, uh, the expectations around space change quicker than we can actually change the space itself. And, and I think that's a really interesting nugget that hopefully you, do, you all take out of this. Then we had this little thing called the pandemic hit. And this has certainly uh, changed our view of the workplace and, and really challenged many of the long held assumptions around how we look to manage and, and build out and operate our real estate footprint. Um, we truly think, right, if you think about the days of yesterday, where the idea that the workplace was really the center of the universe, we had a very, uh, you know, at a global level, many companies on an aggregate level, I should say, had uh, a remote population of, of probably between 15 and 20%. Cisco uh, was much higher. We were, we were a company that embraced flexible working quite early, but at an aggregate level, um, you know, across the globe, I, I think the stats that I say have, have seen had remote working at, at sub 20% to the pandemic where 90% of, of people were working at home and in fact a 12,000% increase believe it or not, of remote working when the pandemic hit, to a world where we think going forward, where we think the expectations of the workplace are going to be very different. What we tend to believe, not only at Cisco, but as we talk to our clients around this is, you're going to have three populations. Uh, you're going to have a population that's going to be fully remote. You're going to have a population that's going to be fully in the office. And you're going to have a very large group of people that are going to be filling this role as hybrid workers ones that will swing back and forth to the office uh, when needed. They will blend both the physical and virtual worlds of work. And, and I think this calls out in many of the things that we see in many, much of the research that has been done recently. Uh, this is an article from Fortune Magazine, some research they did released over the summer where they went back and asked the executives of the Fortune 500 companies what impact the pandemic had on their business. And I think there are two questions in here that are pretty startling and, and telling of to the future that we are all going to be living in. The, the first question was, when do you think at least 90% of your workforce will return to their usual workplace? 26% of those executives said never. And when do you think travel will return to pre-pandemic levels? And 51% said never. And I think what that leads to this is this belief that we are going to have a highly dispersed workforce, not only in the short term, but for the long term. And I think as we think about designing spaces at Cisco, we know that we are going to need to provide different types of spaces, right? And we are going to provide to have to rethink our philosophy around space. And, and technology is going to be an incredibly important part of that. When we think about that, we think about three elements. We think that the workplace is going to need to be more informative. We think the workplace is going to need to be more intelligent. And lastly, the workplace is going to need to, need, need to be more collaborative. And I think it's this last one that we've really uh, embraced our work with Salamander. It's really key to, to a lot of things we're doing inside Cisco. Um, and all the, although the other two are important, I think that 
the, the one that we kind of want to focus on right now is the last one. Uh, and a perfect example of that is an office that we recently opened uh, in Chicago, Illinois. And I can jokingly say we opened because we finished the project and then we shrink wrap the building and we're waiting for a time that we can actually go back, which will probably be post summer at this point. Uh, this, if anybody has been to Chicago, this is uh, a rendering of what they expect post office square to look like. This is the central post office in downtown Chicago. In olden days, uh, you know, it was built back in the 1930s uh, during the WPA. And um, really, uh, any bit of mail that came from the East Coast to the West Coast actually went through this office. Uh, it is now a, a, a newly designed uh, epicenter of, of technology and, and retail and, and mixed use. Uh, a lot of development going on. We, we've carved up about and, and leased about 85,000 square feet in this building. We're going to uh, hopefully when, when this uh, whole situation we're uh, going through is over, we're going to have about 450 employees that this building will service. But the reality is we started to realize even as the pandemic was hitting that we needed to design different spaces. And here is an example of just a small sliver of that footprint. I would say this is about a third of the floor plate. And what you can see is we went heavy on collaboration spaces and in partnership with Salamander in many of these spaces. Um, I will tell you that in this office, which is kind of a mixed use of, of both sales and administration, as well as engineering, a great percentage of the floor plate north of 50% is dedicated to collaboration and collaborative activities. Um, and as you can see, many of those highlighted here. Um, on the left, you know, large uh, meeting spaces for, for big meetings, not as much as we used to because we don't see a lot of those meetings happening. Along the right side, um, pictures and images of some spaces that we work with Salamander on that, that are really more for those small to medium sized meetings. And then a lot of individual and small team space across the top. A lot of one person spaces, two person spaces in these hubble rooms, uh, three to four people. And, and that's a really important part of our strategy is precision in making sure that we have the right amount of space and the right types of space. But as we started this exercise around Chicago and other projects that we kicked off since then, we've started to think about collaboration and this idea that collaboration is not a single activity. When people go to collaborate, there's really four things they potentially could be doing. They could be going to share information. They could go in there to be making a decision. They could be uh, in a space around a team building activity or brainstorming. And believe it or not, each of these has a unique outcome and believes it needs to have a unique set of design elements to make those outcomes a reality. Um, the second thing we started to realize also is we needed to think about collaboration, not only as a, uh, a, in spaces, in walled offices, but we needed to also create places for people to collaborate. And the important learning we had here is the more places we created for people to collaborate, spaces in the open plan, um, places that were casual in nature, yet some of them uh, video enabled, right? What that did for us is that took the pressure off of our spaces, right? We used to have, as many of you, we had issues with people saying, there's not enough spaces, there's not enough meeting rooms. If we started to provide these informal spaces, some of them, as I, as I said, technically enabled, what we were also able to do was lessen the burden on those walled spaces. And, and actually, in many cases, lessen the quantity of those, um, which provided us a lot more flexibility and, and efficiency. And as I said before, a, a keen focus on small spaces. And, and this is a, an area that I know Salamander is really focused on as well. Uh, an interesting fact at Cisco, um, our average meeting at Cisco is 3.7 people in a room and two people remote. That's pre-pandemic. And as you see, um, you can see the average meeting occupancy. This is some stats from a, 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 some surveying we did and some analysis we did for an office we were building in Asia Pacific. In, in that office, 75% of the meetings were less than four people, right? The problem was the office we were in at the time the distribution of those types of offices was in, in imbalance, right? A majority of our spaces were built to handle medium-sized meetings, right? So being able to go back, understanding this and truing this up is really, really important for us, making sure we're delivering precision. 
that precision of understanding how people are meeting and building the right types of spaces and making sure all of those spaces are video enabled going forward so there isn't a less of experience is critical in driving uh, efficiency. When we also start thinking about these spaces, we started to work quite a lot with our architecture and design firms. Um, and, and we have a design team at Cisco that, that is built, it's actually uh, made up of, of people with, with backgrounds in architecture and design. But we also work with the likes of, of Gensler and, and some other far, big firms around the designs of our spaces. Um, we started to bring in this idea that we really need to manage different elements when building out these both these formal and informal collaboration spaces. We need to worry about the orientation, right? We needed to understand how the spaces were oriented and the, how people were, were positioned. We need to really make sure we were focused on posture, right? And, and an upright posture for rooms that we were trying to drive and stimulate interaction and a seated posture in, in many cases for places where we were doing information sharing and decision-making. We had to really worry about the ambiance of the room right, and natural lighting and, and all those effects that came into this, the density of the space, and obviously the surface. And surface shape is really, really important and something that we've started to partner quite, uh, quite, quite a lot with Salamander on. Um, but most importantly, when we think about when we build these collaboration spaces, which I said are now dominating our workplace environments, we need to make sure we're getting three results out of any design. We need to make sure these spaces are optimized, for the outcomes that we're looking to get. We need to make sure they're flexible. And we need to make sure they're adaptable as we know technology is going to change. Um, and, and when I say optimized, and we'll go first there, that is not only for the people in the room, but also for the people that are remote. And I think we sometimes lose track of that. And especially when we, start to, when we started to talk with our architecture and design teams and our partners in that space, there, there was little no little attention given to the remote experience, right? Everybody was kind of focused around the in-person experience. And, and we've done some analysis and we've done some uh, exercises with Salamander on this specifically, right? Around Salamander working with our uh, engineering teams to understand uh, optimal table shape and, and how to build furniture that truly matches up with the technology that you're trying to get in the space. Um, and this is really, really critical for uh, delivering delivering this, this experience that you're trying to drive towards, right? And it isn't just large rooms. The fact is what's going on right now, Salamander is working with our team to really look at this at an entire portfolio of tables that, that we will, will have that will match up with the technology that our engineering teams are building that many of you may be consuming yourself. So, so Chris, I, I'll give you here an opportunity to maybe talk about some of the things we're doing in this space. Okay, well, thank you, Mark. And, and we're excited to be uh, your partnering with Cisco on the panorama table. And as Mark, as Mark was talking about, it's not just about the shape, it's not just about the materials, it's not just about the color, it's about everything coming together in order to have a great experience uh, both with the participants in the room and also from afar as well. Um, so this is actually the first time that we're publicly showing this table. So this particular table um, it actually is right now um, in our engineering lab in Bloomfield, Connecticut. Um, so it's, it's a real picture. Um, we're going to be um, actually shipping this table uh, come say your know, end of uh, April, um, early May is, is when this will go live. We've been working with uh, Cisco on this uh, now for almost a year to uh, develop this, uh, this particular table. And again, it's about the cut-ins as well. You know, uh, you know, can the table accept the cut-ins, the microphones, um, hide the wires, so that way it's very easy to install and the finished product. Uh, you know, let the technology get out of the way and you have a beautiful room for to really have great meetings. And not only working with you know, Cisco, but also our enterprise clients and other technology partners we're constantly learning about, um, you know, how to best adapt rooms to these new, new environments and working with uh, lots of different stakeholders in order to develop um, uh, furniture that really does work well with the technology. You know, we make furniture that loves technology. Um, so along with the panorama table, which will be our premier table series, um, we also have uh, our unified tables. 
Um, and these have been shipping uh, since about, uh, I would say about June, but we've been making these for over a year and a half for uh, select enterprise clients. Um, and we developed um, th these tables along with our technology partners and learning from the first deployments that we did for some of our um, best you know, kind of Fortune 50 uh, customers. Um, and if you go to the next slide, so what you'll see here is that we standardized on three shapes. Um, so we have the rectangular shape, which is uh, you're really the most popular shape. You know, if you look around any environment, you see a lot of rectangles. So human beings love rectangles. But the best shape for a video collaboration is that trapezoidal shape. So you know, that middle um, uh, your table there, you know, that's a trapezoid. Any room that is going to be heavily involved with video conferencing um, should use a trapezoid table. It gets everyone on camera uh, and it, it's a great way to collaborate with people both um, in the room and also external. And of course, you know, as Mark has been pointing out, um, you know, even when this pandemic is over and, and everyone is going back to um, you basically, uh, you know, pre-pandemic sort of lifestyles, you know, one thing that has changed forever is, is, is not as people are going to go back into the office as Mark was talking about, right? There's always going to be video participants in almost every meeting, right? So even those companies that maybe never had video participants before, now they're more likely to have at least one or two during every single meeting. Uh, so having the furniture that works well with that um, is very important. And then finally, we have the boat shape table. This is great for heavily in-person meetings because it gets everyone around the table and they're all looking um, at each other. Now, you know, what you'll see here is, is we have sizes, um, and, and this says you know, you're up to 16 feet, uh, but in reality, these go to as long as you need. You know, we just deployed, for example, a few 30-foot tables. Um, so you know, if you need something small uh, for you know, a small kind of almost like a, you know, you know, like a huddle space or just a little bit above a huddle space, all the way up to your executive boardrooms, uh, we have a size in the unified line that will meet your needs. Um, and then also the materials that we use um, can be specified by your designer or architect. Um, and then we also have a palette of materials that we also use as standard as well. Um, so if you go to the next slide. So the AV magic for this particular product happens in the pedestal base. You know, one of the hard things uh, about getting a table in, in, into a room, especially if it's pre-existing, is matching up where the table needs to go with any electrical outlets or core that's in the floor. Uh, so our pedestal base runs um, along the center of the table, you know, most of the way, you, you know, there's always enough leg room around the table and at the ends for people to sit, but that your pedestal base is in the entire center of the table. So as long as your electric is coming up somewhere in the center, which normally it is, you're going to be able to cover that and hide those wires. Um, and then what you'll see here is that the uh, pedestal base also allows you to have retractors, cables inside, hide those things. Um, and the sides of the table come completely off. So it's very easy to wire manage um, and service as well. And what's nice is you'll notice that there's something called an aluminum J channel, and that actually allows it to be rested on the ground without chipping the um, actual material. You know, so what we try and design and why we have been so successful over the last seven years of, 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 of incredible growth in this channel is that we're looking at the high design that companies want in their meeting spaces, you know, all the materials that those companies want, but also making sure that it's very easy to install, goes in quickly um, and is easily serviced as well. So it's something that we think of the entire life cycle of the product and how we can add value during each stage. Um, next slide, Mark. Yeah, and I'm going to make a, just a quick comment, Chris, on some of the things you said. What One could sit back and say, geez, do I really need to put that much effort and thought into a table? Isn't a table a table? Um, I will tell you that what we're trying to do in our relationship with Salamander is trying to take some of the confusion and some, take some of the confusion and magic out of this stuff, right? If we can work together as partners and create optimal uh, configurations that you can just put together, it's going to alleviate the, the rework that's going to need to be done on site. And it gives you peace of mind that you know you're going to get a predictable outcome. Um, and and honestly, I've been doing this now for a few years and been enough been involved in enough projects where we're changing things at the last minute. 
or we're realizing the, the part of the project that I hate most is I know that's what I asked for, but not what I wanted. Right. So we're trying to get past that and actually provide what we think are these optimal experience by putting the thought leaders together to come. Uh, and as I said, it's just not about shape. It's about structure. It's about mic placement. It's about the surface. It's about the elevations, making sure each of you have all the information you needed just to, to make these things go in as easily as possible. What we're also seeing here is this idea of flexibility, right? We're starting to see a lot of internal uses, use cases in Cisco where people are wanting these intelligent boards. In our world, it's a WebEx board. Obviously, other manufacturers have, uh, have other variety. And, and look, we've deployed these internal to Cisco, probably like many of you, we throw them up on the wall and we hope things work and start to realize that, you know, sometimes you don't get the experience you want. As much as these boards are really good for people to stand up and interact at it, if I'm going to now use it in a seated environment, what you tend to get, and unfortunately, I apologize for the, the shiny uh, dome here that you're, you're having to look at, you tend to look down, right? The camera angles are at a steep incline to the people who are seated, seated at uh, maybe a 30 inch high table, and you get a very distorted experience of the people that are being viewed remotely. Um, in, in this, we've gotten feedback from people. How can we fix this? And we've looked at this from a software perspective. Can we change the position of the cameras? Hey, there's a simple solution for this that we're looking at right now. And Salamander offers these uh, uh, wall stands and lifts that if I could actually just equip and mount the boards on these things, I can literally change the position of the unit when I'm using it in a video centric experience. And just by sliding that device down in a huddle room, I get a very different experience that uh, is much more um, uh, effective for both the in-room and, and remote participant. It's also very good, obviously, for ADA, and, and that's primarily how Salamander had positioned this before. We are looking at it as obviously it solves that problem for us, but it also solves a problem of being able to sort of have that that flexibility that we're trying to drive in these spaces. So, so Chris, you comment on those? Yeah, so we have um, lifts both on wall, and then you can also see our mobile cart there that supports a wide range of displays, all of the WebEx boards. Um, so from your 55, your 70, and your 85 inch um, on something that is wall mounted um, and, and can go up and down or on a cart. Um, that has a wide range of travel. So you, 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 this particular card here goes from about um, 34, 36 inches center of screen all the way up to about 63 inches center of screen. So wide range of travel there. So no matter how tall you are um, or if you're in a wheelchair, um, it's very easy to interact with this. And of course, you know, at, at the high levels, um, it's great for a presentation. Um, and then of course you can bring it down for that video conferencing. Also bringing it all the way down makes it much easier to move around a building, especially when you get to the 85 inch um, uh, WebEx board. Uh, you, you, you know, it's much easier to lower it down. You can see over it. So that sort of ergonomics, um, you, you know, comes into play with these um, carts. Now also we support, for example, you know, lots of deployments with um, other boards uh, with the um, Cisco uh, quad cams, the uh, the room kits, you, you, things of that nature. Um, so it can really be a, 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 a unified communications platform. Um, over here, what you can see is a dual screen cart that we um, support the dual screens up to about 70 inches. Um, this is in its all the way lowered position. Uh, so this is also happens to be um, on a... Um, uh, on a uh, you know cart that is electric lift, we do have fixed site carts as well uh, that also support all these. Um, and then of course we have shelves, and uh, you're, you're in this case for the uh, Touch Ten. <clears throat> yeah, and, and, I, and I'll make I'll make a comment on this also. You know, as people are thinking about the return to office, and and we're even thinking about this as a bit right. The reality is, we're starting to think that you need to consider video in the open plan. If for nothing else, this idea that it allows you the opportunity for much greater social distancing. Mm -hmm. um, and in the, so the offices that we're redesigning now, there, there seems to be this desire to have video, uh, to be able to bring video, bring video to the people as opposed to bring people to, to the video, right? I mean, if that makes any sense. Um, and, and I've seemed to get a lot of inquiries from clients around this as well, as they think about their return to office and just the 
there's just, as we said before, the belief that we are going to need more video because we're going to have a lot more remote participants. I just need an effective way of delivering that. So I think it's an important point that Chris brings up here. So. Okay, and here what you can see is you know, more flexible work environments. Now, you know, I just talked about our carts and our wall stand. Uh, you know, we also, you know, we're a, we're a furniture company um, that's been making beautiful furniture for over 29 years. Um, and not only can we make you know, beautiful furniture that stays in the room, uh, but also furniture on wheels. And what we've been having more of a call for lately um, is furniture that actually can move around. Um, and that's when you, when you want a cart, but you want something that matches your current aesthetic with furniture, right? So we can do that expertly over here. You can see a three bay cabinet that has a display and a quad cam above. Um, you know, we can also um, have this in dual screen. Um, and, and actually we worked on a really interesting um, project with, with an architect for an enterprise client in Canada where they had a large divisible space and they wanted to be able to have three conference rooms, but then they wanted to open up the space and have a big event. So we actually did a seven bay cabinet uh, that was sectioned out and on wheels so they could actually open up that large space. They can move it out of the environment. They could have their event and then wheel it back in. So that sort of flexibility um, is, is possible uh, with our, our structure. And I'm going to be going over our cabinets in just a few slides. Uh, but we do a lot of customizations uh, for particular use cases. So not only do we have a large a variety of standard products that work um, in, in, I would say, 99% of your UC environments, uh, but then we bring our custom division to bear to, um, to de develop products that solve unique product, uh, problems um, for our end users. The next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, you know, we have capability of working with the WebEx boards 55, 70, and 85 um, on all of our carts. So again, we have the electric lift, which is being shown here, but we also have um, the, um, <clears throat> the fixed height as well. Um, and as you see our furniture in a few slides, we are also compatible with all the WebEx boards on our furniture as well. Yeah, one of, the, one of the great applications we saw of these mobile carts uh, is on our multi-purpose rooms, the divided rooms, and be able to just bring in secondary displays uh, because some of these rooms are deep, uh, large and deep in nature, right? And, and being able to have uh, you know, the ability in a moment to, to have uh, secondary displays brought in for content sharing and, and things like that. I think also of the sort of the bread and butter, the salamander business is, is around these uh, credenzas. And it's something that you know, we're just, many of you have probably had the opportunity to work with us over the years. It's just something we're looking at right now as we start to realize that not only is technology changing, but we're not exactly sure, the, sure what the world's going to look like long term. And the salamander product for us is started to come to the realization that it you know, gives us some flexibility um, that if you know, the world changes that we need to start to divide space and we need to start to introduce new technology. We're going to have some additional flexibility here. On top of it, uh, just basic blocking and tackling stuff, the ability to integrate trash, recycle, storage into a credenza and not buying a secondary credenza seemed like a no brainer for us, right? And when we were buying credenzas for spaces anyway, why wouldn't we buy one that was multifunctional, allowed us to integrate technology to it? Yeah, so, you know, on our furniture, and these are our cabinets, and again, you know, we've been making furniture like this for, you know, over 29 years. Um, and what we've seen is, is that enterprise, you know, customers, um, and, and, and customers in all categories, you know, including higher ed and other places, what they love about our furniture is, again, we can match any decor, uh, we have a wide palette of our standard finishes that ship really quickly. But one of the big benefits is the ability to mount all of the displays to the actual cabinet itself. Um, and that means that there's no need for wall reinforcement. You're running conduit in the wall, moving electrical or data. Um, so when you think about the elevation drawing that happens um, when a room is being done, right? It always calls out where the blocking needs to be and where all those things need to be. And that costs 
um, end users, you know, you know, thousands of dollars. You, you know, we've heard um, that on average, it's about three to six thousand dollars, you know, for that wall to be modified for these displays to go up. Um, our cabinets can hold, um, you, you know, up to four hundred pound monitors. You know, dual four hundred pound monitors. Not that many monitors are that heavy, uh, but that's UL listed to that weight, right? So we have cabinets that are both. Now, this is a freestanding cabinet that you're seeing here. This is twenty one point two five inches deep, and you can put it in front of a window. Right. You, you saw some imagery before that Mark had um, on slides where, you know, a ca where a, a panel was in the middle of a room um, or against the window. Um, and yeah, that's something that causes problems. You know, if you have these nice glass meeting rooms, where do you put the actual display? And on one of our cabinets, you know, can be a great um, a way to go. And it saves both time and money. There's less people involved in the installation. Uh, these cabinets come. Um, pretty much almost completely built. So there's very little um, on-site uh, building of the cabinet. You, you're normally, um, it's simply just placing in the shelves. Of course, there's racking and cooling and all those things because uh, they've been designed for AV. Um, and we work with your design team um, on the finishes, uh, whether it be one of our standard finishes or something uh, or a laminate or where maybe we're you know, custom matching um, um, you know, in-room millwork, we'll make sure that the cabinet, you know, matches your aesthetic um, expertly. And also making sure that the elevation that is called out in the AV spec is also matched. So for example, with the um, Cisco quad cams, we see a lot of, uh, you, you know, 44 to the, you know, the 46 inch range. Um, and we help specify that across multiple different size of monitors. So if, for example, a whole buildings being done or global or, or say a global rollout, and you have many different types of rooms that may be getting 65 inch displays, some get 75, some get 98, some get dual 75s. Um, all of that is going to affect um, how these displays get mounted. And also as the size of the displays change, how high those displays need to be. So we'll take care of all that AV um, while also working with facilities or the design team in order to make sure that the external look um, is exactly what's needed as well. Um, and then and then manage that deployment again, you know, whether it be in the US um, or globally, you know, to make sure that it shows up you know, when it's needed for a really quick installation. Um, in fact, you, you know, these mounts are already mounted onto the cabinet. So you know, I kind of joke around, but there's no need to even bring a measuring tape a lot of times because we have everything locked into the AV spec. Yeah, and I think, Chris, one of the big things that it did for us as we started to deploy these is it took technology off the critical path when we were putting the plans together, the construction documents. It was a very easy conversation with, in our case, JLL, which is the, the firm that manages a lot of our projects, standard height. Well, what are you going to put in there? It doesn't matter, standard height. <laughs> so uh, it, it just it, it just simplifies so many things. And then, look, if we want to move things around, standard height, right? Um, we were allocating, uh, as we were refreshing technology at Cisco, you know, $1,500 to $2,000 a room for room remediation. It's off the table, right? That's the nice thing about these types of solutions as we think about uh, the more pervasive use of those. Yeah, and also, you know, as you dig in and, and find out how these are constructed, um, you know, the cabinet can be reskinned at any time. So, you know, not only is it movable where wall construction isn't, you know, for down the road, but normal cabinets, you know, if you want to go from a white cabinet like you see here to, say, a, a wood style cabinet, well, that would be replacing the entire cabinet because the structure of the cabinet are those panels, right? You know, with us, we have an internal structure. Um, that you can actually, you know, redo and you can put these panels on any any color, any style. So as the aesthetic may change in the office place, um, you can you make this uh, and refresh it, you know, which means that it's it's more sustainable um, than standard furniture as well. In, in this case, in this case, what you can see is you know, we had an enterprise customer that was using the uh, Cisco Dual Seventies. And they were building out a wall for ADA compliancy. So, so you can see that ledge there. Um, you know, they were building that out for ADA compliancy. Um, and, then, then, and then they were using non-AV centric cabinetry for some other gear. And you know, anyone that's been involved in a lot of AV installations knows what it's like when the cabinet is not made for AV. You have to cut holes in it. Um, you know, if, if you don't 
you know, more holes for the um, fans, holes for wire management, right, for pass-through. Um, you know, our cabinets are built to manage all of that um, and, and also be ADA compliant, right? So this, you know, took wall construction, cutting and everything else and put it into one nice package that could go in in a day instead of multiple weeks. And that was um, a case study that we did with, you know, several of our clients uh, where their normal room refresh would literally be, you know, uh, at least a few weeks, if not a month, uh, with multiple trades. And it literally goes down to two, maybe one business day with just the AV team getting everything ready. So it really speeds up everything and helps um, save money in the budget. So you can spend more money on technology, which is great, and deploy more rooms given a, 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 a budget as well. Um, so here's the type of cabinet that I was talking about, where if you have that kind of glass environment or or there's a situation where the cabinet is not going to be against the wall at all. Um, we can not only freestand, you know, again, up to 400 pound monitors, not a problem, uh, but also we can finish off the back. So working with those designers and architects, I um, mean, you know, when you have this internal uh, window sort of situation, you don't want to see the wires, you don't want to see um, your know, backs of displays. And we have many different ways of, of, of finishing off the back. And over here, what you can see, um, is is wood panels that match you know the wood in the room, and you can see there you in one of our tables as well. So this is very popular and, and a problem that we solve daily um, for lots of our clients. Next slide. Um, so here's something uh, that Mark was talking about um, with the height adjustability, right? So we have the electric lift, and then we also have what's called our easy touch system. And that is uh, something that's spring loaded, it's tensioned, so you can walk up to you know, the largest of monitors and very easily raise and lower, it'll stop wherever you need it. Um, and then you can also put those on our cabinet, so that way there's no wall infrastructure, all those benefits I just talked about. Um, and this in case, it's a it's a 12 inch deep, 20 inch high cabinet. So that way that monitor you can come down um, even farther. So that way, again, people in wheelchairs um, or, or shorter people, kids, you know, things of that nature can very easily use that interactive flat panel, uh, but then they can also raise it up into presentation mode as well. So you're being very adaptable um, and uh, sustainable um, is, is really what we're all about. Next slide, Mark. So you saw you know, one of our huddles in, in a previous slide. Um, here are some actual installations in Atlanta. Um, so you know, working with this corporate client, we um, uh, developed you know, kind of a longer table that, than is standard uh, for our, our standard huddle, but it's on our standard huddle. We have a cabinet. Again, these um, displays are mounted to our structure, so there's absolutely no need for any wall modification. Um, you know, I was on the phone with a large healthcare provider and they were just going over their plans for this rollout that we were talking about. And I was on the phone just to be there if there was any questions about the Salamander's part in that. But what was really interesting to me is that they had these really small rooms. And as they were going through the room, and, and it was like, this is going to be a private office, this is going to be a huddle. And then there was one room where they weren't sure what to do yet. And then someone piped up and goes, you know, we don't have to make the decision right now because if it's going to be a private office, we can offer, we can order the office furniture, the desk and things. If it's going to be a huddle, we can just order the huddle. We don't need to worry about any of the infrastructure um, on the wall. We can change these rooms as needed depending on the use case and what we're seeing in the environment, right? And that is you know, very important. You, you know, these companies are getting more stats on how these rooms are being used than ever before, what the temperature is, how many people are in it, so on and so forth. They use that information to then you know, decide how to maybe adjust that layout, adjust the room use, and when you have something that's done, you know, in our system, instead of standard construction, it's much easier to make rapid changes um, in the environment based upon um, how that room is being used. And of course, if, if the environment gets used more heavily, it's a better investment, right? Then if you have a room type that is just empty and not being used, right? So we really help companies, um, again, on the initial installation and through the life cycle, um, be more adaptable um, in their spaces. Mark? Yeah, and, and Chris, to your to your point about that too, you know, we we often debate this notion of flexibility versus adaptability, and what is the difference? I mean, flexibility is the ability to get multiple uses out around one experience. Adaptability is to be able to change the experience over a longer period of time based on the changing needs of the office. And what you just described around building private offices and potentially, you know, converting them to huddle spaces or vice versa, 
That is the challenge I think we all face as we return to the office and we don't know what the expectations are of our employees. We don't exactly know how they're going to, you know, what, what their behaviors are going to be as they start reusing space again and why this stuff is so powerful. So I just want to chime in. If anyone here, has we, any questions, so we have a couple of questions in the Q and A box. If anyone has any questions, type them in now, and we'll get to them uh, right at the end. All right. Any questions you want to cover now, Chris, or do you want to just go on? Um, well, there's a question: um, Is Cisco working on voice control for AV systems? Oh yeah, certainly. That that's a standard feature right now uh, across our entire portfolio. It has been it has been for a while. Um, and uh, uh, you know the reality is the, it's important. It's even more important in these days of a return to office. So you know the same things that you could get with uh, uh, you know in, in the home environment uh, with uh, Alexa and whatever else. Think about those same capabilities. Uh, we have you know we go hey WebEx start my meeting. Hey WebEx you know add Chris. Hey WebEx uh, mute my call. Um, you know so. I think there's a, a lot of options there um, that, that are coming on the forefront. So, yeah, so thank you. Um, and then there's one question uh, that is for me. Uh, do you, have you thought about mobile AV carts that are battery powered so they can be placed uh, where there's no power outlets? Um, yeah. So, you know, as far as, as far as that goes, you know, all of our carts have, have racking and storage. Um, so this should be something that is more for, um, either you're getting a UPS that works for the gear that you want to um, power, right? Um, or if the manufacturer of that gear, uh, you, whether it be a display or other peripherals, um, offers a battery that's that's specifically made for that. Um, so we will house that, um, and uh, so that way you can uh, then use it. Now, however, what we do have is a 30 foot reel of retractable power cable that can go onto the back of any of our carts. Um, and that normally gets you access to an outlet. Um, you're normally in any sort of building environment. Um, and this is not always the case, but but normally you're, you're less than 30 feet away uh, from a power outlet. And one of the things with batteries and battery technology today is that running any sort of display normally um, is, is only gonna have about an hour or so, maybe two hours of use so you're going to be having to plug in um, to uh, your recharge um, often, right? Um, so we think that the 30 foot reel of retractable power cable is actually the better way you know to go. However, we can store batteries, um, you know, on our carts. Absolutely. Um, do you have any? Uh, do any of the freestanding solutions require wall anchoring, especially the low profile cabinets? Um, so our standard depth. And, and deeper cabinets, we have 21.25 and a 30 inch deep cabinet. Those are freestanding, don't have to touch the wall at all. Um, our 12 inch deep cabinets, they do require drywall anchors. Those anchors do come in the box. Um, those anchors are not for any weight bearing on the wall, it's simply for tipping. So the same way that uh, you know, a dresser in a child's room, uh, you would anchor to the wall to make sure that it doesn't fall on top of them. Um, it's the same sort of thing. So those come in the box. And again, our four bay low profile cabinet, 12 inches deep, is UL listed to hold a 400 pound panel with just drywall anchors. Um, and those cabinets come in one bay to as many bays as you need, depending on how many displays are gonna be, and also for ADA compliance. And we have we actually have experience in deploying those also at Cisco those those uh, low profile ones and they're 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 quite nice especially on boards because boards you want to make sure you're not hindering the people getting up and interacting with it so it's really important to do those shallow ones um, so you're not hunched over and, and not and preventing access to all areas of the of the intelligent board. Okay, I think uh, that's all the questions at the moment. Hey, you know, I, hope, I, I think one of the things we wanted to leave you with, the, the reality is that we started to think at Cisco um, about our workplace environments. And um, I think the thing that's driving a lot of our behaviors right now around how we're thinking about space is the reality that the work, after, after a year of this nonsense that we've all gone through, right? The fact is when we all can now see a day when it's, we can get back into the office and, and whether that's uh, the beginning of the summer, the end of the summer, or or sometime uh, in the fall, hopefully we'll get to that point. 
the reality is the workplace is going to need to work, work a lot harder to earn the trust and respect of people. And we start to realize that right now. We are going to need to offer experiences that are different, that are better than what people can get at home. And, and that is what is driving a lot of our um, design philosophy around how we're introducing not only technology and space design together, that we need to offer something special that will pull people back in to the office environment. Um, but the concepts are, are pretty straightforward, right? The fact is the workplace is changing dramatically and it, it is going to be centered around collaboration. As I said before, when we look at our floor plates, I have offices that we're designing now that are 75 to 80% of the square footage is dedicated to collaboration. That's how much we think the world potentially changes. You know, secondly, the fact is to get it right, you got to balance space design furnishings and technology and furnishing is increasingly becoming an important part of that equation and our, our relationship with Salamander is uh, proving very worthwhile in that area. Um, as I said, you know, the, going forward, the, the key success factors for us are optimized, flexible, and adaptable. Is quite honestly, once again, optimized, we need to know, we need to be able to offer something special, flexible, our people are going to want to have flexibility in how they use the space and how the space adapts to, to, to or addresses the things they're trying to get done. And obviously, as Chris just talked about, adaptable, right? We're not exactly sure what the world's going to bring going forward. And being able to have the ability to swap things out easily is important. And, and probably the most important thing that I can share with you from our lessons learned this is not a technology discussion. This is not a real estate discussion. This is not an HR discussion. This is all three of these stakeholders coming together and staying aligned. One of the most interesting things that happened before the holiday at Cisco was our real estate team, which had previously been reporting into our COO organization, now works for our head of, real, uh, head of HR. And that is a recognition that as much as we think about managing big real estate assets, it isn't really about that. It's delivering new experiences. As we say at Cisco, moments that matter. Um, and that is across an, an, an employee's entire life cycle with us. And every time they go to the office, it's a moment that matters. We want to make sure we give them the best experience possible. Thanks, Mark. And just to uh, sum up Salamander and, and why um, to look at us, you know, for your next deployment um, is, you know, we'll specialize in low imp impact installation. Again, you know, saving the time on infrastructure and the money on infrastructure. Everything will connect quickly. So things like um, wire management um, and, you know, cooling and all those things, you know, they're built into the cabinet, right? So we are, you know, designing um, beautiful pieces of furniture that that you know, you can be proud to you know have at your C level suites all the way through that organization um, that will make sure that the technology kind of gets out of the way as far as the aesthetics goes and it's just a beautiful inviting environment that has everything you need to have engaging meetings. Um, all of our products are premium crafted. You know, they're hand built in Bloomfield, Connecticut, 100% solar powered facility. You can be proud of that. Uh, with really designer styles, you know, our standard finishes, I would say, you know, of our enterprise clients, and, and some of them are the largest companies in the world, they use about 99% of our standard finishes because they are absolutely quality materials. Um, but then they'll also utilize our ability to custom match and also use different materials um, in those special environments. Um, we also have an eye on ADA compliancy, you know, both with our mobile products and, and with the um, cabinets that get installed in rooms um, and you, mobility. You know, obviously with a cart, it's mobile, but with a, a display on a piece of furniture, that becomes mobile, too. It's adaptable. Again, wall construction is not movable, but you can move a cabinet to become more flexible um, as things change. Right. And no one expected what happened last March. Um, but I think moving forward, um, lots of companies don't want to be caught in that situation again. And having an eye on your next deployment being as adaptable as possible means that you're preparing for whatever eventuality happens in the future. 
right? And, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that the future is going to be better, but it's going to be different, right? It's going to be different than it was before. It's going to be different than it is now. And five years from now is going to be different than 10 years from now, right? So, um, you know, our furniture lasts a lifetime and adapts with whatever comes up. Um, and that leads us to upgradable and retrofit friendly, both upgradable in the technology sense um, and also with the style as well, right? So we can go from a heavily technology you know, cabinet to a hospitality cabinet with a refrigerator and trash recycle and those sorts of things. And this is all coming to you from a sustainable manufacturer, 100% solar powered um, and made in the US, uh, which we're incredibly uh, passionate about and proud of. Um, so thank you, you know, very much for uh, so joining us today um, on your Friday. And um, you, you, I put a link in the um, chat that is our white paper on standard construction versus salamander and also my contact information. Um, so if you have any questions, please reach out. Um, and I wish you all a fantastic weekend, Mark. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks.